Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Well, we're going to see how this works. Thank you, Michael, and I really mean that. Um, I'm a convinced alcoholic. My name is Bill Moore. Um, the reason I'm taking time to thank Michael is because I think that's the nicest he's ever been to me. All right? So I appreciate your being here today. I appreciate uh, this show of hospitality that you've put on for me today. Um, it's, it's really great. You know, I'm still amazed, uh, a drunk like me, um, to be invited any place. It's still a little bit amazing because not so very, very long ago, uh, I can remember going to the house of my families at different times, and when my car drove up, the lights went out. Um, that's the type of drunk that I was. So to be able to travel this far and to find a group of people that is still my family, it's just great. And I have absolutely no doubt as to why this comes about. It's strictly by the grace of God and this fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. See, Bill was in charge of his life for many, many years. That's why, well, that's why I had to go through all of the experiences that I did. But for the last few years, it's been a lot different. My home group is a Thursday night 12 Steps and 12 Traditions study. My sobriety date is November 23rd, 1975. And that's part of the miracle. That's part of the miracle right there that a drunk like me doesn't have to drink anymore. Part of why I identify as, an, as a convinced alcoholic is because my days around this fellowship, I have watched, I have heard, I have listened to a number of people come dragging back after they had decided to do, well, a little postgraduate work. And they always say the same thing when they come back more dead than alive is that they forgot. They forgot to go to meetings. They forgot to call their sponsor. They forgot to get on their knees. They forgot to do this. They forgot to do that. We see the type drunk that I am. I don't know if I've got a second chance or not. I don't know if my ego would allow me to come back should I become insane enough to take another drink. So I have got to stay convinced that I'm an alcoholic because if I don't stay convinced, there's a chance that I might want to be normal again. And for people like me to be normal is to die. And, and for the first time in my life, I want to live. Now, the reason I give you my full name is because it was Dr. Bob that said, uh, at the level of the group, it's almost the same tradition break to be so anonymous that your friends don't know you in Alcoholics Anonymous. Think about this for a moment. You ever had one of those occasions where someone was in the hospital or someone did something in your home group? You were trying to describe them to someone else. You would tell them how many times they beat their kids, how many times they went to jail, how many times their wife threw them out, but you don't dare whisper their last name. There's something wrong with that. I want you to know that my last name is Bill Moore. If you come to Santa Rosa, California, Bill M. is going to be hard to find, but you can find Bill M., all right? So come on out. And, and then, too, let's be honest about it. During the good old days when I was drunk and falling out, drunk and getting beat up, drunk and going to jail, drunk and this and drunk and that, that's the time that I wish I'd had some anonymity. But, you know, during those times, they wrote it all up. They told you who their mother, fa mother was, father was, where he went to school and everything. So the way I'm living today, I'm not ashamed of who I am. I'm not ashamed of you to know where I live. So you've helped me to turn a page in my life. And that page is one of being eternally grateful for everything that you've given me. And a little bit later on, I'll tell you exactly what it was that you gave me. Um, Michael talked to you about um, some stuff that I've been involved in. But you know what the bottom line is? I'm a drunk. The highest state of consciousness that a drunk can achieve is sober one day at a time. And it's only been by the grace of God that I've been able to do a lot of things that I've never been able to do before I came to AA. One of them, not drink one day at a time. Do you realize how difficult that was for me all those years before? It was impossible for me to go a day and not drink. And I'll tell you why. When I did not drink, reality, old Bill Moore, all of my lies, all of my insecurities, all of my feelings of inferiority, all of my shame, my guilt, my embarrassment, all of these things kept crashing in on me. 
the first time I knew any relief from all of that emotional baggage was the first time I got a drink, which was at 13 years old. And I need to tell you that um, I don't know what makes an alcoholic. I don't know, you know, how I became, really. But I know that I am a drunk today. Some people will tell you that it has to do with environment and upbringing, you know, all this stuff. That could be true. But if you look at upbringing, if you look at environment, there's no way I could be a drunk. My dad was an ordained minister, okay? Baptist. And you guys know what I'm talking about. In California, when I tell these people that my dad was an ordained minister and that I was raised in the, in the heart of the Bible Belt, uh, they don't really understand that Bible Belt thing. But here, you'll understand that. My dad had that Bible in one hand and a belt in the other, all right? And, and for a little, little guy like me, he needed that because uh, uh, I was that type of person from day one. So I did not come from, quote, a bad background. What I do know is that enough was never enough. If you told me you loved me now and that I was the best little boy you'd ever seen, I needed to hear it again in about 20 minutes or it all went away. I was in a constant state of wanting to know that I was okay. There was something about me that I know today was born inside of me that I was not okay with me. I didn't know who Bill, Bill Moore was until I came into Alcoholics Anonymous because here's the way I live my life. I tried to figure out who you thought I should be, and then I tried to be that person. And I could be anything or anyone that I wanted to for brief periods. But I had absolutely no identity. That's the way I came here. It was almost like in the big scheme of life, as our big book puts it, the whole world is a stage and there's a production going on. Everyone in this production has a sheet. And on that sheet, there's a symbol there, an L or an O or a Q or something like that. And under that, there are little lines that they're supposed to say. I was born into this production. I had no sheet. I had no lines. I had no place to be. And so I constantly popped up at the wrong times. I said the wrong things. And I was always on the outside looking in by my own opinion. And so, therefore, I never fit. You know, somewhere around the ripe old age of 13, um, I had a couple of the older guys, my heroes, introduced me to the elixir of the gods. Okay? It was called Mr. Mac Wine. I was talking to someone here. Where's that other wine connoisseur? There she is. Okay. <laughs> you got a lot of people who want to talk to you about wine that had corks in the bottles and stuff. Real wine drinkers don't have time for corks. You know, we need something we can screw off right quick and get it done. And Mr. Mac Wine is what I was introduced to in an alley in Graham, North Carolina. And it was the, the reason I needed that shot that night was because there was a girl at the dance. And back then when we went to dances, at school. I don't, it's probably not that way today, but all the boys were on one side of the gym and all the girls were on the other side and we sat and peeked at each other. There was a girl there named Betty Jean. My God, she was the prettiest thing there. And I wanted to ask her for a dance, but I was afraid. And I want you to hear my thinking at that ripe old age. If I asked her for a dance, if she said no, I would be crushed. If she said yes, what kind of a girl was she to want to dance with me? Can you hear that double-edged thing that I had going? But anyway, I started across. I looked at her. She looked at me. I chickened out and went out the side door, shaking. There were a couple of guys, my heroes, standing in the alley outside the gym, and they asked me what my problem was. And I told them that I just didn't have the courage to ask this girl to dance. They said, we can help you with that. They wanted to know if I had any money. And, of course, I had money. They took a quarter of mine and left that alleyway, and it was maybe five minutes. One of these guys came back. I need to get rid of this because the show starts now. When they came back to the alley, he was cradling something in his arm, about the way you would cradle a newborn baby, very gingerly, and it was a brown paper bag. And when he brought that brown paper bag on into that alley, he set it on the ground and he rolled the top down on it. And out of the top of that brown paper bag came the neck of a bottle. And the neck of that bottle, he picked it up. And here's where this wine connoisseur stuff comes in. He slapped the bottle under the bottom. For you real wine drinkers, you know that breaks that vacuum seal on it, and then you can screw the cap off. <laughs> it was a bottle of Mr. Mac wine. 
Mr. Mac Wine, as soon as I saw that bottle, something wonderful started to happen to me. And when they told me that since I was the newest one there, they were going to let me drink the poison off. That's an old term you don't hear anywhere but around here. And they let me drink the poison off of Mr. Mac Wine. I want to share this with you. My disease is one that's threefold. There is the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual. I'm going to talk to you first off about the emotional. When they handed me that bottle emotionally, I grew about three inches. When I turned that bottle up before that Mr. Mac Wine had a chance to get any further than here, I knew that I was the coolest dude in the world, and it hasn't got past here yet. And the thing that let me know that I was a drunk was when I had those first couple of hits on that jug of Mr. Mac Wine, there was a warmth that just came all over me. I was a tall, skinny kid, big feet, knobby knees, ears stood out like this. I was very self-conscious. But by the time that third hit of Mr. Mac Wine got to here, I was a changed human being. I had become immediately a man of the world. I felt my big feet shrink up a little bit. My knobby knees started to flesh out, top and bottom, and my ears started to lay down beside my head. That's the magic of alcohol for me, folks. If you're here and you don't understand what I'm talking about, then you're probably not an alcoholic. Every drunk here knows what I'm talking about. And that night I went in and I did things I had never done before. Oh, my God, I danced. And see, in my daddy's house, you didn't listen to that kind of music. So the only dancing I'd ever done was with the doors, all right, with the mop when I really wanted to cut a mad one. And so that night, that lady that I danced with, if you go through Graham, North Carolina, there's a nice little lady there about my age, and she still walks with a slight limp. That's <laughs> one arm is just a little bit longer than that one, because what I had seen were those old movies of Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, Peg Leg Bates, Mr. Bojangles. So what you got was a combination of all three of those out there on that floor that night. And it was the most amazing transformation I think I've ever gone through. That night I got drunk. That night I talked to my first girl. I danced with my first girl. I made my first pass at a girl. I got slapped the first time there that night. That night I started my first fist fight. That night I lost my first fist fight. That night I met the police for the first time in my life. That night I went to jail for the first time in my life. That night I wet my pants. I threw up on myself. God, I had fun. Yeah. Most normal people would say, holy smoke, I don't want any more of that. But do you know what I remembered? Were those few moments where I was on top of the world, where I was everything that I wanted to be. And for the next 25 years, I continued to chase that place where I would be okay. And I ran from place to place. The reason I ran so much was because people didn't understand me. People were baffled by me. I'm, I was convinced until I came to AA that people were really envious of me. This is why they gave me such a hard time. Today I know that I was obnoxious. My school teachers all of a sudden weren't smart enough for me. I didn't want to take direction from anyone. I remember my dad telling me that, boy, if you're going to live in my house, you're going to do as I say. You see, my father didn't understand who I had become, and I let him know that. And when I still didn't get the respect and the response that I wanted, okay, God, I'll keep it clean, all right? When I still didn't get the respect and the response that I wanted, I ran away because I knew that my ran running away would make him suffer, the whole town of Graham. Everyone would suffer when I ran away. Nobody even missed me. Um, but I did my first geographical at 14 years old. Uh, I ran away, and needless to say, where I wound up, Things did not go well there. I finally came back home, and I talked my dad into signing the papers that would allow me to go into the military. Now, the reason I needed to go into the military is because I'd watched those old movies, and during that time, they had those cardboard cutouts where they had Uncle Sam with his beard and that high hat, Uncle Sam needs you, and I knew that if I could get in there, get a submachine gun, about a 50 caliber, no small stuff, 50 caliber, get a bottle of booze in this hand and a few girls back behind me, give me any war, and I would win it for you. And that's what I went in to do. And these people didn't know who I really was. They really expected me to do the same thing that everyone else did. They didn't realize that I was special. They wanted me to get up in the morning same time as everyone else, uh, wear the same uniform as them. So we got off on the wrong foot right away. Um, um, I made it through basic training and finally made it to Europe. And I was fortunate enough to, to, to go into a, a transportation outfit in Mannheim, Germany. 
and uh, got a chance to travel extensively all over Europe. I don't remember a lot of it because my third day there, I was introduced to Hennessy's Cognac. Class six there, you could get a liter of it for 92 cents. This goes back a few years, folks. And, oh, God, you talk about hog heaven. I drove all over the place, and I know there's a God because I didn't kill anyone driving those tractor and trailers all over the hills and valleys of that place. And But even there, I didn't get a lot of um, understanding. Um, the military had its own set of rules, and they just didn't quite go along with my way of living life. So I would write letters home one time, and I was specialist fifth class. The next time I was specialist fourth class. Then I was PFC, then private. And um, next time they had to hold my mail because I was in the brig. Um, bad things kept happening to me. So I finally decided that the military wasn't for me. I needed to get out because they didn't appreciate special guys like me. What I needed to do was to get out of the military, find Miss Wonderful, get married, and live happily ever after. I got out of the military, found her, lied to this lady. I promised her moon, stars. I don't know if we had satellites in 1961 or not, but if we had them, well, I probably promised her a couple of them anyway, because I promised her anything that it would, took, it would take. She bought it hook, line, and sinker. We got married, and uh, the marriage went along fairly well for a few months, and then she started to make uh, unreasonable demands, you know, like, she wanted me to go to work and uh, bring the money home, and uh, I could do a little of that, but the thing that ruined our wonderful marriage was that she was very possessive, and she didn't want any other women in my life. And she didn't realize that I was different. I was a special breed of guy. So after my giving her the best 11 drunken years of my life, she booted me out. That's significant because that was the beginning of something that became wonderful, um, getting booted out and going through many, many years of hard, hard drinking um, and always feeling sorry for myself but always blaming other people. Um, um, I had the occasion to have a wonderful lady and uh, my daughter and uh, her son come out uh, to California because I had promised them that I was never, ever going to drink again. and. Um, so she came out and she brought her son, David, and she brought my daughter, Nikki. Nikki was about um, a year old then, and I had promised her that I would never, ever, ever, ever drink again if she would just come out and give me this one more chance. And she came out, and um, after about two weeks, uh, we agreed that I had really, really been good, and that since I had been that good for two weeks, that I had proved that I wasn't really a drunk and that maybe in celebration I could have one beer. And she says, well, one beer, but just one. And she said, I will go and get it. I says, no, sweetheart, I want you to stay here. I will go and get it. On the way to the liquor store to get this one can of beer, see, I'm real smart. I started thinking, one beer is going to cost X number of whatever, but if I buy six, it's going to be cheaper, and I've only got to drink one. Now, doesn't that make sense? So I bought six king-size beers, drank one on the way home, walked in the house with one. And she could not understand why I kept polishing the trunk of the car. And it wasn't long, I was drunk. And this lady did me the greatest favor, didn't feel like it at that time. She did me the greatest favor that could ever be done. She looked at me and she just told me that um, I'm leaving. And I couldn't understand why. And she looked at me and she says, I don't intend for this child to grow up watching you die. Nikki was about, uh, and this is my daughter standing back here, and Nikki was about uh, 13 months old at that time. And she took Nikki and she left. And the heartbreak of it was Nikki and I were both crying. Her mother, Betty, was crying. Her brother, Bear, David, was crying. Everyone was crying. But my tears were, they were mixed. Uh, I didn't want to see my daughter leave. But I knew that if she did leave, uh, that if her mother left, that I would be able to drink again. You see, I had reached what my big book called that jumping off place, and it's where I knew that I could not not drink anymore. And But when they left, I went on the last big drunk that I've ever been on, and I wound up in treatment. Went into treatment on October 17, 1975. You know that's not my sobriety date. I'll get into the little change there. But that was a turnaround point for me. 
I had to lose something that meant more to me than anything else, my family, before I could finally say, maybe it's time for you to do something. And I remember being carted off to a public detox, and I had to sit there with those people in their little ragged shoes and their worn-out pajamas that were hand-me-downs, and I had to watch those people as they shivered and they shook, and you know the other stuff that we do like that. And for the first time in my life, I saw me. I saw that I was no different from those other people. See, part of my alcoholic denial was I could always say that I wasn't that bad. I always said that I wasn't a bum, but I was most comfortable drinking with people that did not care who know that they drank. It gave me a sense of being a little bit above to go out and buy a bottle and hang out with the guys in the alley. My sickness pervaded every part of my life. But it was there that I finally got the hint that I needed something other than what was happening to me. The old men that took me to detox, a German guy about this tall named George and a Filipino guy about this tall named Hal. Only in AA will you run into that. A German guy this tall, a Filipino guy this tall, coming to 12-step, a black guy that wants to die. And between the three of us in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, they helped me to see something, and that something they helped me to see was that one day at a time I could live without drinking. What these guys gave me was hope, and the hope was even though I knew that I couldn't do it, was that if I hung around with them tight enough, close enough, maybe I could stay sober a week or maybe a day or maybe two days. And, folks, that's the miracle of recovery in this Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous like with our preamble, to show other alcoholics exactly how we have recovered is the primary purpose for this book of Alcoholics Anonymous and our preamble, to share our experience, strength, and hope. That's what they did with me, and they gave me the hope that I needed, that maybe I could. Now, you talk about miracles. You talk about divine providence. I had run all over the world being born in Graham, North Carolina. And when I stumbled through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous the first time, the man that met me at the door was a little man from Roanoke, Virginia. This little man from Roanoke, Virginia had spent a lot of his time around Graham and Burlington drunk. He and I had been in some of the same jails, had driven our cars into some of the same uh, corn patches, had been picked up by some of the same highway patrolmen, but that man had 17 years of sobriety. I knew when he told me that that he was lying. No one stayed sober. 17 days, let alone 17 years. But he told me, he says, Bub, you are one sick puppy. He says, you need a lot of help. And he said, God has put me here to give you that help. He said, I want you to know that you got lucky today. He says, I'm your sponsor. Back when I came into AA, newcomers didn't get a chance to roam around in the back of the room and try to figure out whether they were high bottoms, low bottoms, wide bottoms, dirty bottoms, and no bottoms, all right? They were met at the door, and they were told little things like this, simple stuff. This is Alcoholics Anonymous. This is what we do. If you are a drunk, then you've got a seat here. Right? And this is what brought me into it. I told you that I came in on the 17th. There are some people that walk into AA, and they're still looking for that easier, softer way. I was one of them. I knew that I was going to stay here long enough to get the treasure of Alcoholics Anonymous to float me alone. I was going to get the president of AA to write my job a note saying that I was okay, and I also wanted a note from a wife saying that he's changed his ways. That is what I came in here to do. I was going to give you guys maybe six weeks, then I was going to get on with my life. All right? And that's the way I came in. Now, I needed to get hooked in with this higher power you people talked about, but you've got to remember what Daddy did for a living. I didn't want anything to do with God because I knew what God was doing. He had a big chalkboard up there. And all the stuff that I had been doing, he had one, Bill Moore. And every time I did something, there's a hash, 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 and then he crossed them off. That board was full of hash, 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 cross things. I didn't want God to know anything about me. I didn't want any connection with him. And you started talking to me about this God stuff. I said, well, if i got to hook up with him, I'm going to take a shortcut, get it over with quick. So what I did was hooked up with some of my friends. Hear this? Friends. The ones that came into the meeting late came to the meeting sporadically. They left early, never put any money in the basket. They giggled a lot during the meeting. You could even hear them whispering. They told me one night, they said, you're not drinking. That doesn't mean you've got to stop living. And my ears popped right out. 
you know. Old Harold was talking about, this was my sponsor, go to meetings, read your big book, call me, all right. When you're not with me, read the steps. Go to meetings. And it just got dull. And I needed a little bit of excitement. I was young, okay? So I hooked in with these people, and they told me how I could bridge that gap to that higher power. We sat there in their house, and we rolled up some of those little no-name cigarettes. <laughs> and I went on a spiritual quest. But for some silly reason, my sponsor didn't go along with that method, okay? That old boy set me down as soon as he found out about it, and he kept me sitting in one place for three hours. And he talked to me about changing seats on the Titanic. It took three hours for me to finally get what he was saying, that no matter what you switch off to, if the ship is sinking, you are going to drown. I finally got it. And what he told me was then, he says, you know what? If you are putting that stuff in you, you can't be around. He says, tell you what I'm going to do. He said, rather than throw you out. I didn't even know he couldn't throw me out. He said, rather than throw you out, he says, I want you to come to two meetings a day until I tell you it's okay. And I said to me, okay, I'm going to go to two meetings a day, but as soon as I find out he's not there, I'm not going. Old Harold was there for two meetings a day, and finally I just gave up and said, oh, well. And I started going to meetings and listening. He started taking me out on 12-step uh, calls, and somewhere one night he said, Bub, I think it's okay for you to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous again. He said, mark this date on your calendar, November 23rd, 1975. That night he gave me a big book that I usually travel with, but I forgot to bring it this time. It's in a brown paper bag because it's falling apart. But then from that night to this day, I have found my connection with my higher power, my God, the old-fashioned way. I get on my knees and I talk to him and I turn my will and my life over. And I'm so grateful for the simplicity that a couple of old guys, a couple of old drunks laid out here for a drunk like me. Can you imagine a bankrupt stockbroker and a shaky proctologist getting together and coming up with something like this? Anyone here that does not believe in God or divine providence, you think about that. Bill Wilson was six months sober and ready to get drunk. And instead of reaching for a drink in the Mayfair Hotel there one night, he reached out for another drunk. And the most unlikely candidate in the world was a doctor that was had lost it all there in Akron, Ohio. And what Dr. Bob told his wife, Ann, he says, you're putting pressure on me to get me over there. I'm going to go over. I'm going to talk to this guy for 15 minutes. Then I'm out of there. Bill and Bob met there in a carriage house at the Cybling Estate in Akron, Ohio. Dr. Bob, just to get Ann and, and uh, Henrietta Cybling off of his back, decided to talk to Bill. Fifteen minutes. Six hours later, they're still talking. And out of that came this wonderful thing that you and I have got here. So I don't take this for granted. I don't take it lightly. I know that there's no way that two new drunks can pull something together like this. I believe that Dr. Bob and Bill were the channels, the vessels, that God passed this message on to you and I. And, you know, I don't take that lightly because here's what I remember Dr. Bob saying to Bill just before Dr. Bob died. He said, Willie, we've got a good thing here. He said, let's not louse it up. Let's keep it simple. And that's the message that I try to carry, and that is that we've got a good thing here. Let's not louse it up. Let's keep it real simple. It's simply about one drunk talking to another. The message that I have for you today is that there is hope. I don't care how far down the ladder you have gone. You can stop, get off, and hook into what we're doing. And the sheer force of this fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous will allow you the freedom that I know, that you know today. But there are no shortcuts. You are not delivered from hell. You're given 12 steps that allow you to walk from hell back into happiness. That's what those 12 steps are all about for me. I don't believe that they're put there to be used if you need them. I think that they are there for people like me. It's the only way out for me. If I could have gotten out of my dilemma any other way, I wouldn't be sitting here today, but I tried those other ways. And since I've been here, the dreams that I dared not dream before are realities. By the simplicity of simply admitting that I'm powerless, and that my life is unmanageable. That was the first step into honesty I'd ever had. And then old Harold helped me to understand why my life was unmanageable. He said, Bub, 
Your source of power is your alcohol. And he says, you can't see that the more power you try to take, the sicker you get. He asked me a simple question. He says, Bub, and you notice he called me Bub a lot. I think Harold probably called me Bill about five times in his life. Bub was his loving name for me. Dummy was when I was being Bill, all right? But when he said Bub, he said, Bub, I want you to look at something. He said, if you take a drink of water, a drink of alcohol, and you pour it into a glass, he said, what shape does that alcohol assume? I said, I'm not stupid. It takes on the shape of the glass. He says, okay, if you put it into a saucer, what shape does it assume? I said, the shape of the saucer. He says, when you put it in you, bub, what shape do you assume? Harold and I had a lot of deep conversations. He talked, and I said, oh. All right? And that was one of those O's, because that's what helped me to see what happened to me every time I drank. I never knew what was going to happen after that. Then more unmanageability. And in order to deal with the unmanageability, I drank more. And it was a vicious cycle. And do you know when he suggested that maybe I might be a little bit insane, do you know I balked at that? But you see, for you new people out there, I need to be honest with you. When you're sitting around these old timers, and they start talking to you about some of the stuff that they've done, they're going to tell you how stupid and crazy they were. And if you are a drunk worth your salt, you're going to tell them how stupid and crazy you've been. The minute you tell these old-timers how stupid and crazy you've been, you're going to see them grin. The real old-timers will start to salivate a little bit. And you know why? Because they know they've got you then. Because you have proven to them that you are insane. And they're going to talk to you about maybe being restored to sanity. But you've got to know and accept the fact that you're insane before you can be restored. This is why it's the old timers are the backbone of AA. If you read through all of our material, it tells you who the true leaders are in these home groups. It's that quiet assurance of the old timers that have been through it. And they sit there and they watch and they wait. And whenever you need to hear something, it always pops out of one of those old timers. And in three, you ask me to make a decision. You ask me to make a decision to turn my will and my life over. And if you're anything like me, I was not going to turn over everything that was Bill Moore and as our 12 steps and 12 traditions say, become that non-entity, the hole in a donut. But this is where Harold and sponsorship helped me. He said, Bub, what are you hanging on to? He says, have you got a big bank account? I said, no. Have you got a car that's worth anything? I said, no. Are you married? I said, no. He says, what have you got? I said, nothing. He says, well, what do you want to hang on to? I said, oh. <laughs> he talked to me about shame, resentment, anger, embarrassment, guilt. He said, bub, this is the stuff that you drink about. He said, that's what they want you to turn over there in step three. And I said, oh, <laughs> again. And we got on with step three. And I was willing to let go of all of that Gut sickness. When I talk about that gut sickness, you understand what I mean. The, the kind that puts a knot in your gut and there's also a knot in your throat at the same time. Only drunks know that feeling. Dr. Silkworth says this phenomena of craving and this phenomena that you and I go through, only certain classes of drinkers know that. And that's drinkers of our type. Other people never go through this stuff that we go through. Step four, an inventory. Fact-finding. For years, I lied about things that I had done, up, down, and around, one side and then the other. But step four gives me the ability to put that stuff on paper and talk about what I've gone through. Talk about some of the wrongs that I've done, some of the people that I've hurt. Step five is about being willing to talk to my sponsor, my higher power, and myself about this. And the reason I need to talk to my sponsor and not just God about it is because my ego does not like to be put down. So I tend to tell people what I want. And I have lied to God before. When I sat with my sponsor and I told him the exact nature of my wrongs that I had put down on paper, and I had to get real. I had to have him sit there and look me in the face. He had to help me to work through my denial on this thing, my embarrassment and my shame. And step six uh, is all about being ready to be rid of some of my worst defects of character. Step six helps me to really recognize what a sick human being I was all about. And you might think that after going through step six and becoming ready, entirely ready to have God remove these defects of character, you might think that would be it. But they put in a step seven because they know that people like me, I'm going to try to hang on to some of those things that are really shameful and, and embarrassing. 
Step seven tells me that I need to humbly ask God to remove these shortness, uh, these uh, shortcomings of my own. Step seven lays the groundwork for me putting out a list of all the people that I've harmed. And it tells me that I've got to be willing to make amends to these people. Making that list, I had no problems with that. But when it came to step nine and trying to go out and make those amends, I remember telling old Harold, you don't understand, Harold. I said, some of those people deserved everything they got. And I said, I'm not about to go to them with my tail tucked and tell them that I'm sorry. And Harold had a way. You knew when you were on thin ice. He would drop his bifocals on you, and he would look at you over the top of those bifocals, and he said, Dummy, it ain't for them. It's for you. And I said, Oh. Because what he helped me to understand was that I needed to clear away the wreckage of my past. These people, honestly, when I went back to see some of them, they told me we had forgotten about you. We thought you were dead. Most of us wished that you were, but we knew that you were crazy. People had dismissed me. But by going back and facing my past and getting it out of the way, it gave me the most important thing I've got, and that is today, right now. You know that the day I can get an envelope of any size, I open it right up. <laughs> Did you ever get envelopes, especially manila envelopes, and couldn't open them up? Didn't know what was in it? Do you remember having knocks on the door and saying, oh, my God, wonder who it is? You can tell a good drunk, go to their front door or one of their front windows, and you'll see that a corner of the blind, a uh, corner of the shade is going to be turned up just like that. My shades and my blinds are all straight now because I open the door and I can look out. When my phone rings, I just pick it up and say, hello, you know. <laughs> my life has been brought around in front of me by the grace of God and these 12 steps. Step 10 tells me that after I have cleared all of that wreckage away, that on a daily basis I need to keep my ego intact. I need to constantly check my motives. I need to check me out on a daily basis. I've cleaned this house. I've got all of that garbage out of the way. But if I'm not careful because of my ego and who I am, I can create more garbage as I go along. So step 10 is what allows me to stay in right now and in today. Step 11 says if it's going that good, you've got to remember what keeps it going that good. Conscious contact with my higher power, whom I choose to call God, is what keeps my life running smooth. When I get up in the morning, my first thing, <laughs> especially at my age, when I realize that I am breathing in and out, in and out, I am happy. And I say thank you, God, for another day. All right? That starts my day. God has fulfilled his wish for me and my dream. Now it's time for me to get busy and live that day. Step 12. Having had this spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message, not my message, not your message or their message, this message as it is contained in the book of Alcoholics Anonymous, that I tried to carry this message and practice these principles in all of my affairs. And I want you to look at it. We come to the end of this thing in step 12, and it tells us to practice these principles in all of our affairs. Step 12 is something else, too. The theme of it is the joy of living, but it's also about giving something away. And this is where you've given me the ability, by your confidence in me, to serve as your, as your coffee uh, 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 cup washer, to be the ashtray dumper in, in the home group, to become the greeter in my home group. You trusted me to do that. In my old home group, it became my group when they allowed me, when we were redoing the carpets and things, they allowed me to paint the baseboard around there. It became my fellowship. And I hope you hear what I'm saying. They allowed me to work and earn the right to be a part of that fellowship. It became mine. And I would do anything to protect it. Step 12 also opens up the door to something else. It's about getting outside of me a little bit more. It's about serving the group. And then after serving the group as a group secretary and as a general service representative, I had the opportunity to, to uh, share with my district as a district committee member, then a district in, in California, North Coastal, we've got district committee member chairs. And then I was elected to the area committee as the assembly coordinator, then the area chair and and the thing that blew my socks off was when I was elected uh, the delegate to the General Service Conference. Panel 33, 1983. I want you to hear real clearly. 
that when you voted me in, something happened that day. The first thing I felt was fear. Oh, my God, what have I gotten into? And I want you to hear the magic word, I. What have I gotten into? Immediately, I was all by myself. And what I said, secondly, is, wow, I have arrived. When I arrived at that general service conference, I went there with my chest poked out, head swollen beyond the capacity for most doors, and I went there to straighten those people out. But here again is where the old timers come in. There was one of the old timers there attending that conference. And what they call those first year delegates was new ones. All right? You've got the old ones and the new ones. And I went in there as that new one, and what he did with all of us that first day is he took us out the 42nd Street side of the Roosevelt Hotel in Manhattan. Early April, it's still cold. We walked out of the door, came out of the, the tunnel and out of the door, and he just stopped, and he didn't say a word. If any of you have been around Manhattan or big cities that, where it gets cold, what we saw across the street on those grates in Manhattan where the warm air comes up, vents for the subways, was a group of people, some of them wrapped in plastic, some of them wrapped in cardboard, and they were laying there to stave off the cruel winters of Manhattan. And occasionally, you would see a corner raise up on one of those, and they would pass that telltale brown paper bag with the top rolled down. Not a word was said, but it was almost you could hear a hissing sound as those inflated egos were deflated. Because when I watched a group of drunks laying on those grates, passing that same bottle that I got started with, it helped me to realize why I was there. It was almost like going to the old ballpark when I was a kid. We never had the money to get in, but we would peek through the openings in the planks and the knot holes. When there was a tight play, they would take one of the guys and let him stand on their shoulders to look over in there and tell them what was happening. I felt like Alcoholics Anonymous had allowed me to stand on their shoulders to peek into that arena of general service to get a picture of what was really happening so that I could come back and give you a play-by-play. -play. The play-by-play -play is simply this. We've got a good thing going here. Let's not louse it up. Let's keep it simple. Because the thing that I knew, I found out at that conference, is that that day, and this day right now, there's some drunk, not very far from here, that's dying, that's stumbling, staggering, that's wanting a different way of life. And they will never find it unless rooms and meetings like this, unless people like us are out there to put out that hand to help those people. That's what I saw in that big arena. No more complicated, no more sophisticated than that. Yeah, we went through a lot of rigmarole. But that's what it boiled down to, is really one drunk talking to another. I was fortunate that during the time that I went, people like Dr. Jack Norris, Milton Maxwell, uh, Mike Alexander, these people were still very active in the, in the uh, conference. Lois Wilson was still alive. I had the chance to have dinner with Lois a couple of times. Lois served a tea, as tea at Stepping Stones in 1983. Uh, Lois was spry right up to the end. Um, there's been a lot of good things that's come in my life since I've become involved with this fellowship and willing to give just a little bit back. And I need to tell you now that there is some selfishness in everything that I'm doing because there are two little boys standing over there right now that Grandpa has probably given a gift. And if that gift comes to fruition and they're stumbling someplace, I certainly hope that the hand of AA will be there for them, just as strong, just as vital as it was the day that I walked in. So this is why I like this thing about this primary purpose group, because it is every alcoholic's primary purpose to stay sober and reach out to another drunk. That was Bob and Bill's dream. And you know, while I'm on that, I need to share with you. I hear some people complain a little bit about some of the new people coming in. They talk about people coming in from spin drives and halfway houses and things like this, yeah, they're coming in. And they say they come in mixed up, and they come in confused, and they come in belligerent. Every drunk I've ever seen, I don't care where they come from, they come in belligerent, confused, and mixed up. And all we've got to do with those people is give them the same tough love that we've got. I remember when they first started coming in, and I wanted to just corral them all up, get a stick, and beat them into submission. And then my sponsor said something to me. He said, uh, Bub, 
how would you respond if someone told you what you could not do and could not say? And all I could say then was, oh. He said, if you see someone that needs to be talked to, take them out. Buy them a cup of coffee. Give them a lot of love and a little respect. And tell them the way you see things. And for the last 20-some years, I've been doing that. Most people don't want to hurt AA. But a lot of people don't know that they're hurting AA. And what I owe that person is the same love that I got because I was belligerent, hard-headed, and I insisted on doing things my way. If people hadn't loved me enough to get me healthy, I couldn't be here with you today. Life is so good. That's my mantra today, that life is good. You've given me so much. And some of my getting around... I was at a meeting last year we talk about carrying the message. It's easy to see what it's like to carry the message to a different group here. But for many years, I've been going to China. And until about four years ago, the People's Republic of China made a flat statement, we don't have an alcohol problem. And what they told me was this. They said, if someone gets drunk, we will have a member of the party go to their house, talk to them. If they get drunk again, then they get an hour of psychiatric evaluation. If they get drunk again, they go to prison. And so they said, we don't have a problem. But as I've traveled from Shanghai, Xi'an, Beijing, Suzhou, you go to certain areas of China. When you see a person laid out on the sidewalk, and that telltale puddle running downhill from him, you know why they're laying there. A, a hot cup of tea does not produce that effect. I knew there were drunks in China. So we finally appealed to a few people, and we got a few of them to come, the professors, the doctors, the PhDs, to come to our international in 2000, to come to see whether AA was a cult and whether it would be subversive as far as the Communist Party was concerned. They came, they observed, and they went back. And what I need to tell you now is that I'll be going to China again at the end of this month. And I'm going to go to meetings that are open meetings in the People's Republics of China in Beijing. Because of the efforts of drunks like you and me, they were, we were able to reach out and show them that we presented no threat to them. And I was at a meeting just last month, uh, last July, where we had the first two AA members from the People's Republic of China that were allowed to come out by themselves. They came out to an Asia Oceanic Service meeting, which takes in the whole Pacific Rim. We try to help those new countries that are coming up, publish literature and things like this. At this meeting, we had the first two representatives from the People's Republic of China. Mr. Ma, Mr. Ma had two years of sobriety. What I told the people when we first started getting it going, and I says, well, it's not right to have the professionals running the meetings in these hospitals. I said, if we get two or three drunks sober, you cannot continue to tell a drunk what to do. They'll find a way to get their own independence, and by golly, in less than three years, they were able to do that. AA is alive and well in China. We had these two people. Mr. Ma had two years of sobriety. He brought along one of his sponsees that had one year of sobriety. Neither one of them spoke any English, but they brought along an interpreter. And if you think that's something, for the first time in recorded history, we had two people from Mongolia. And if anyone is familiar with the Great Wall of China, it was built to keep those people from the north, the Mongols, from coming in. And here you've got the People's Republic and two people from Mongolia, the first time out, holding hands and saying our serenity prayer. Now you tell me, that ain't the work of God. Yeah. So I do things like this, and this is what keeps me really, really charged up. And at home, uh, I've got to fight to get the job of the coffee maker in my home group. All right? I am one of the luckiest drunks in the world. You look at this. I travel here, and here's my family. This guy out here, Michael, I'm going to tell a little bit on him. The first time I met Michael on a windy day like this, you'd have to rope him to the ground. That's how skinny he was. All right? Look at him now. All right? You tell me there aren't miracles in this world. And if you aren't convinced of the miracle there, when you go home this evening, look in the mirror. You're going to see another miracle. You want to see one right now? Look to your right and to your left. These are all the miracles that God creates. 
God does for us drunks what we cannot do for ourselves. And there's many a man and woman that are so cheap to the whole world, to the whole crowd, because what we do and the way we live does not make sense only to another drunk. People have tried to beat us into submission. They've tried to incarcerate us. They've tried to threaten us. They've tried everything. And when you come to AA, all they do here is just love people into good health. It is so great to be a part of that. And I'm going to close with just the bottom end of a poem that my sponsor really liked. And it talks about people not really understanding the soul of a drunk and how being touched in the right way makes all the difference in the world. We travel along, we have our glasses of pottage, we have our glasses of wine, and we're going, and we're almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowds never can quite understand the change that's wrought And the thoughtless crowds never can quite understand that change is wrought simply by the touch of the Master's hands. All of us sitting here today are here for one simple reason. We've been touched by the Master, but the Master has given us a job to do. The job that you and I have is to share this message with other people, to get out, to talk to people, to love people, to stop judging, to just be one of these drunks. And for that, I am very, very grateful. Now, what you've given me, just my life, the best life I've ever had. So thank you for sharing your day with me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.